Hi, hello, welcome to Two Facet Podcast, a podcast when, where we talk about building digital products. I'm Matt Mikulski and I'm here with my co-host. I'm Funka Gonzalez. Yeah. So today we met to talk about a topic that everybody has in their lives every so, sometimes. Um, so it's a starting new project. Exactly. Starting a new project. Yeah. We all of us do. Yeah. <laughs> so today we're not going to focus on any certain methodology as we usually do or part of it. Uh, more loosely talking about what do we do in our lives when we need to start a new project. Exactly. So what happens? What happens? <sighs> So, okay, let's imagine whether we are in a team, right? Mm -hmm. And we have our goals for the quarter. And then we have this opportunity that we want to tackle, yep. right? Okay. So as a team, probably maybe the product manager uh, will come and say, hey, we need to tackle this opportunity, or at least we think it's going to be impactful for this queue, yep. right? So this would be like the starting for a project, at least normally how, how it gets to me. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then what do you do with this information? Okay, so um, first of all, for me, the moment that the project comes, mm -hmm. it's a moment where you need to stop and think, yeah. <laughs> right? So, so the worst thing that you, that you can do, especially as a product designer, is to be like super fast on, okay, then what is it that you want me to draw or to design and then jump into it, yeah. right? So the first thing is to start asking questions to know if you have all the information even if you understand everything. Yeah. So what questions do you ask? How, how, how do you get to this? As a designer, I think it's very important that you're sure that you understand the why from a business perspective. Yeah. Right. So we were saying, OK, we think as a team that this is a good opportunity for us to tackle this queue. But why? Right. Yeah. So it is important to understand this. So if this information it's not uh, bringing to me, I normally ask for it, right? Okay. And try to get deeper, deeper into it. It's also a personal thing that I really want, like to understand everything deeply. But yeah, that would be that would be the first step. And once you understand why it has uh, sense from a business mm -hmm. perspective, then you can as well come to users, right? Like, like why is it something that will help our users? What does where does this information come from? Is it that we have research about it? Or how do we know the user has this need yeah. and, 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 and what does it mean for the user, this opportunity? Yeah, yeah. nice one. For me, uh, about this like first step in everything, no? so creation of a feature, or it's uh -huh. like why, how, who, etc. <laughs> I would say I ask the same questions, just on a bit different level. So let's say usually what's going to arrive to me is either an opportunity found in the research. So uh -huh. let's say in few interviews we saw this pattern, no? And it's like, hey, let's let's think about this one. And in those cases it's it's usually better because we are a lot about problem and needs and opportunities and it's like a space I, I feel comfortable in, no? So the why and for whom mm -hmm. it's easy there. Now what usually super blurry and you totally have no idea what to build. <laughs> But it's more comfortable space for me, no? Yeah. Uh, I like to start from there because I can understand that the problem space exists and what is the problem, how does it show itself in the life of a customer or a user, no? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the other way I'm getting sometimes things are feature requests, no? Yes. And then they're going to come either directly from the customer um, and then in those situations I want to spend a lot of time thinking about why the customer needs what they request, no? Mm -hmm. So it's like fine, you want this feature, this button, etc. What is going to do in your life? Why mm -hmm. it's so important for you? Because majority of the times there is different solution than doing this button or whatever the customer wrote. Not saying you should not never do anything that customers want. It's just a lot of times there is a yeah. probably better solution. And then the third one is when it comes directly from the stakeholder. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's going to be mm -hmm. feature requests, sometimes it's going to be opportunity. But on those, I usually first questions I'm going to ask to those people is how does it fit to our strategy? Uh -huh. No, uh -huh. So how confident are we about this thing? This is for me to protect my, myself from my own bias. So the problem is I'm super easy to be hyped about new stuff. Mm -hmm. New stuff is super shiny for me. <laughs> Implementing and maintaining, iterating is great. Not that shiny for myself. No, So it's super easy to hype me about new feature every time. 
Uh, but then we need to do things that bring value and are viable. No? So it's not that we should start a business line every time we have an idea for a new business line. So I'm always trying to back, backtrack it to the business strategy or a product strategy um, and see how does it fit, how, conf how confident we are about it. If it's not aligned with the strategy, pro most probably I'm going to try to say, hey, guys, either we change the strategy or let's forget about it. Um, if it's something aligned, then yeah, we can go deeper into why, for whom, what, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. hey, can we not think feature, can we move back to opportunity space with the stakeholder and stuff like this. But yeah, it's super important for me, the same, no? to understand this problem space first. No? Yeah, I like how you put like these three scenarios and thinking about it from these three scenarios. The first one where the information comes from research, I bet for the designer, normally here, this is where you need to ask the least questions because normally you're working Ideally, you should be working together hand in hand with the researcher, right? Yeah. So when the opportunity is chosen in the ideal situation, the designer has been already part of the research process and collaborating with yeah. the researcher. So this is the, the easier one. And then the one coming from the stakeholders or from a feature request, this one probably you will need to make more questions and challenge it a yeah. little bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Which don't get us wrong. No, sometimes it's as easy as customer asks for a checkbox. Let's do the checkbox. No, and then it's the best thing, no? but then better yes. to understand if it's really the checkbox that we need to build, no? because I would say in majority of the cases, it's, it's vice versa. So when doing this, whatever the customer wanted, it may be unreversible step. And mm -hmm, then mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. just get deeper and deeper into hard solutions if you didn't got the problem solution right. Yes, yes. And as well, from the from the design perspective, understanding it perfectly helps you, you know, answer questions later. Like if someone comes and it's like, hey, well, you're putting here a checkbox and not a toggle or why is it not like a model or something like that? Yeah. If you deeply understand and you have made all your questions, you're super clear of why you're having yeah. this. So then it's super easier to answer to feedbacks or any person who's interested in the, yeah. in the or if you're not confident, you are at least, I would say, um, you can be challenged and then you know where did you make the assumptions, no? Uh -huh. So you can say like this, I know, and this, I believe because, hey, we have this experience or yes. we run this thing and we believe that it's going to work. So you can be aware of your own bets, where actually yeah. the bets are and the learnings that maybe you want to have with, with this And feature. it's normal, especially if we are talking problem space. It is risky, no? And majority of the things are unknown. So it's about embracing unknowns and then as much as we can know, great. And then let's be clear about what do we don't know, but we assume that this yes. should work, no? Yes. Because if something fails, the first thing you should check is like, did the assumption work, no? Yes. Not the facts, facts gonna work. Um, the assumptions may be a bit trickier. Yes. And for me, one, one tool that it's very useful at this stage is the, the problem definition. Yeah. For me, this is super useful to actually have in like a one clear sentence, exactly a summary of this, this problem space, no? Yeah. And the problem definition should include um, who's the user and what is the need that the, the user actually has. So everybody has it like written down in a, in a short way. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Yeah. And then here, practical thing is I used to do it a bit more generic or um, ambiguous so it can catch, you know, and be this motivational sentence, whatever. Uh -huh. But I believe that's bullshit and you should be as like explicit as possible in this problem yes. definition. Like if for now you have only a clue about individual customer, but not your enterprise version of this customer, don't write you're going to cover customers. You know, you're doing this individual type of a customer use case right now and be really, really explicit because broader it gets, trigger it's going to be to find solutions later to it, I would say. Exactly. And to evaluate if the solution we're going for was the right for the problem, because yeah, yeah. if the problem was blurry, how do we know if the solution exactly. is the right one? It no? needs to be really, really well defined. Yes. So we have our problem, let's say we covered our stakeholders. They're happy. Uh, what do we do with solutions? So. What do you normally do when you approach solution space? So for me, the first step is to choose the approach, right? So I wouldn't say there is always exactly the same, the same process mm -hmm. to tackle the solution. So it's very important to choose the right approach. And it will depend on the size of the problem, I would okay. say, that, that we have at hand. Um, because in this problem, we can have big unknowns, right? And 
it can be like a big problem or it can be maybe like a small iteration, a small enhancement of something that we that we already have. So this will let us know which approach we're going to have and we can go for like more like a big things like a design sprint or some big activities with the team like big ideations or maybe we can go for a I don't know, shape up works super well for small incremental improvements yeah. and small iterations. So for me, this is something important to decide before starting working okay. on anything. Yeah. For me, what I do a lot, either already in a pro solution space or right before, let's say I'm writing a pitch or something like this, mm -hmm. is like I'm a tech geek in a, in a heart. So what I do is I try to invent the most sci-fi solution i can imagine right now okay okay you know it's gonna be powered by ai and blah 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 blah. no and then i try to put on on top of that like our boundaries so in both cases like doc planner and user signal we are not technology company meaning we are not inventing technologies no yes mm -hmm. it's not that we'll invent like a new ai system anytime soon or anything like this no we are using customer enterprise grade tools that exist and then we built our own products from it but it's not that we invented any of those mm -hmm, parts mm -hmm. um, so the same goes for my scientific sci-fi sci solution no so when i invent that one then i try to go on the internet and find if there's apis or services that you can use no and for me the great sign is amazon has it as a service <laughs> it's like okay this is buildable no and worst case scenario you pay five bucks great no and if i find only like experimental open source project started a year ago then it's like okay whatever we're trying to invent here we need to scale back to technologically no? or hey this is not gonna be feasible the sci-fi solution so then i'm trying to cut this back to something doable or say hey we don't have a technological stack that will allow us to do it no it's like for example in both companies we don't work a lot with ai so now mm -hmm. implementing send anything ai based would cost us to get knowledge about it, no? We need to become an expert about AI. It doesn't be, it doesn't happen in a week, no? So you need to think investment of a year versus can we do suggestion mechanism? Yeah, probably, no? So let's scale back to suggestion mechanism. Yes, yeah, sci-fi. Unfortunately, you're not going to be talking to machine anytime soon in Doc Planner, no? Okay, so first thing you're doing is checking the feasibility, starting with the fanciest solution yeah. and then scaling it down. Huh, okay, that's very interesting. So for me, feasibility, of course, I am not checking the feasibility because I don't have a lot of tech uh, knowledge. So for me, this one comes later. So it's like okay. I choose the design approach I think is the one that fits. And then in that approach, developers are included. So yeah. I co-create the solution with them. And for me, in this process is where we will check feasibility. So we will decide how big or small the solution is going to yeah. be together with uh, the feasibility. Yeah. Mm, good one. Mm. Yeah, for me, it's more... You know, building a yeah, that's super kind to shape up when I think about it. We are crazy <laughs> about that methodology, uh, but yeah, yeah, for me, I'm doing that feasibility to be able to create the boundaries, no? Yes, yes. So then I know if we would be in 2005, because that's the best example I can find. Some Ajax calls or asynchronous work in web was not the best idea for some things. So then I we would already know that, hey, for this one, let's not implement anything asynchronously right now or real time mechanisms, not worth it. And it's going to spend us three months because I found 26 articles fighting about how to approach it as a new thing for web. So eh, let's not be on the first frontier, maybe with our new solution for our customers. No, sometimes maybe you want to, uh, but not in a lot of cases in an uh, established company, for sure. Okay, technical boundaries. I really like how, how it is like, <laughs> like different because for me, in my head, of course, with my, my strength and my understanding, for me, the most important boundaries are the user boundaries. So like yeah. the user problem. So have the problem bounded and know that we don't want to, to go outside of that one. And for me, this is why the problem definition should be yeah. super, super well done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but for but me, it's com complementary. You know? They are absolutely complementary, but it's like we're we're having a look to it from different yeah, perspectives. Because you know, yeah. the problem is maybe the customer wants to be able to search photos in their phone by words, no? Yeah. And there may be an implementation you had nowadays in your phones that mm -hmm. has you type and then there is an AI and object recognition in photos and stuff like this. 
And there could be a search and tagging system for manual work for a customer, which worked for years in like iTunes, yeah. uh, photo albums, you had tags and stuff like this. And thousands of people were doing that manually to be able to search for wedding party 2001. No? Both problems were the same. Solutions were absolutely different. And then if it would be in 2005, I would say to you, hey, we need to have amazing tagging system and suggestions. Yes. I would not be yes. pitching you. Let's build Siri, no? And then the photos you're going to be able to type cut and then the photo appears. I, I mean, that would be my sci-fi solution. And then I would most probably cut this down to, hey, but technically yes. in the scenario we are working in, we cannot aim at six years development of AI solutions to see if we can map it back to the customer. No? Yeah. And when you reach this point, this is like... Um... This is like a moment where you will need this information that we were uh, getting at the beginning of the why from the business perspective, yeah. right? Because this will also let us know if we can in, can or want to invest yeah. more resources on it or less resources. So we really need to understand the why from a strategy yeah. and business perspective. And yeah. all of this, uh, I would say, also maps back to the product vision, no? So when we are creating like a product vision, this should be this ultimate goal of yours for the next five to six to ten years no mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. like tesla they're now on their second round of product vision after 10 years or something like this no the, only now they changed a bit slightly of product vision fairly short but talking about future so in our example probably our product vision five years from now would be the let's type cut but if mm -hmm. we are now what's the first step we should do on this path no most probably it would be the tagging system and if we have money, maybe we hire some data scientists to uh, like explain us what the AI is, no? Exactly, yeah. I like it because for me, this would be like a nice moment for me to co-create, both mm -hmm. uh, from the technology and the, and the UX perspective. So this process, I think, for me, when I enjoy it the most is like going through this feasibility okay. process together with the design process as well. So also understanding the flow, where it fits in the, in the system, in the user yeah. journey. And then you try to, to combine both. So, and up until here, I think you can still do it without any UI. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, totally, totally. So, that's the thing I learned after a few years. But yeah, 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 it's you, you don't need UI usually. It's like the last thing you need to build, I do believe so. And I would say it's a tip too. I mean, it's, yeah. it's super tricky. So, everybody's like used to have UI. Mm -hmm. and, and by UI, I mean anything like high fidelity. Like high fidelity, exactly. Drawing on a piece of paper is not UI. It's drawing on a piece of paper. And like mirror board is just a mirror board. It's not a high fidelity prototype that you can click. No, it's it's a difference. Um, and yeah, usually you don't need UI. Your stakeholder is going to ask for it and your customer is going to ask for it, etc. But it's a way of changing the approach. No, So it's like if we are working about something, we don't know how the solution may look like. It's stupid to assume it at the beginning. No? It's just yeah. like, let's yeah. let's forget about the UI. Pieces of visual design, let's say, <laughs> yes, for sure. Yes, like, like tons of screenshots, like yes. there are visuals there, no? But it's not the UI. A saying to how a lot of times previously I worked was like either I was preparing like high fidelity in the meaning of the detail level mock-up mm -hmm. so it would be ugly but still like hey here's the autocomplete with those options and stuff like this so i would ideate a lot myself or with the designer before hitting like the dev team um the actual customer mm -hmm, mm -hmm, will mm -hmm. it solve or not like does it make sense no is it the best solution we can do for a problem um yeah and now we don't use UI and it's easy, no? So it's, <laughs> we are talking about what shall it be doing. And then I would say after some years doing this way, it actually doesn't. So the UI itself doesn't pay that much of an attention in the SaaS products, etc. No, yeah, it's like, yeah. yeah, it's actually, it should be boring UI. Um, in a SaaS product. <laughs> yes, because you want to you, perform you should be your tasks, you want to be efficient. And efficient no? So there yes. should be not no elements of UI and, and anything crazy. No? So you actually should be able to guess the UI. No? If you put the five people with the problem, they should arrive to fairly similar solutions taking in consideration how your system is built. No? Yes. For sure, there are different products, no? a bit more innovative or cutting edge when it comes to the user interactions, etc. But we are here in a, you know, SaaS products. Yes. So it's it's fairly 
you need to be coherent. <laughs> now the user is using that daily. It's not about every screen having its own designer flavor in them. No? It's... Yes. I would say I totally agree with you. And, and still there are moments where maybe you want to do some UI. Mm -hmm. Moments where you may need to, I don't know, have maybe some inspiration of a concept of something. Mm -hmm that you may want to move towards or, or have in the future. So that will be more like a concept, something more inspirational, but it is super important. And this is why at the beginning I would decide on the approach. Yeah. So you'd, you should be very conscious of why you are doing it and what is the purpose, right? You're not doing the UI right now because you will be coding it tomorrow. Yeah. It's more like an exercise to maybe imagine the future or have a concept to, to visualize yeah. the direction or something like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. So more working on the product vision versus like tactics, yeah. no? And yeah. I would say, when we are talking tactics, I would rarely use design sprints, even though I love techniques, no? Yeah. Then there are, usually you should be already done with them, no? You should do them way before to understand your long-term vision, what, where are you going long-term? And then, yeah, whatever you're doing today is just a byproduct of this vision and strategy. Exactly. Yes. So, solution, um, and then what do we do? with like alignments no so as every product you start with discovery then you align on solution but then you start building it no and yes then you need to build it and yeah. then different approaches and different tips and tricks so what do you like to do inside the cycle sprint or however you're gonna call it so since I tried shape up, I have to say that's my favorite one. Okay. Why? Because it's it's the methodology I found that works better with Lean UX, where you actually are co-creating with the developers and with the rest of the team, right? So it's like you're more like leaving the design process yeah. and aligning everybody. So a lot of times de development and code are happening in parallel, and I really like this part. Uh, but it is true that, that sometimes, for instance, in the project I am working right now in the planner, we, for some reasons we are not doing shape up, so we are doing mm -hmm. more like a Kanban, which takes you a bit like in a, in a parallel dual track, right? Mm -hmm. So the designer goes, it's working in parallel to the next things that the developers will be developing. And for me here, it's super important to try to have all the time touch points with the, with the developers doing some small co-creations with them mm -hmm. on the different different stages of the of the project right so even if you're doing like in a dual track try to bring the whole teams in key moments of the of the design to make decisions together and to and to be aligned yeah nice from my perspective hmm, the one trick or maybe it's a preference nowadays uh, is like you will see two types of product managers, product owners, or however it's going to be called in your in your company, um, is you're going to see a person that is heavily inside the team, also including delivery. Uh -huh. So, you know, talking about what stuff to do first and tasks for developers and if the pipelines work and if we have test uh, environments, etc. Um, and then the problem, co-creation, this person is a bit everywhere and trying to cover for everything. Um, and then there is a different role, which I like a bit more, which is I trust my engineers. <laughs> <laughs> Not that this is trust issue. Sometimes it's just impossible and you need some unlockers. No, but I would say the goal for everybody should be to be comfortable with the engineers. And if you need delivery managers, team leaders, whatever, I would say their responsibility or the team responsibility to be able to ship the stuff that they're working on. And then I really like to focus more on the way the product manager can contribute to any development cycle as sprint is actually going back to their responsibility. So it's about value to the customer and viability mm -hmm. of the solution, mm -hmm. no? which a lot of times is going to be, are we going to generate money on this stuff? Um, and, and this you can influence a lot, especially in any methods that, uh, require co-creation, mm -hmm. you can come back as this, you know, living barrier of like, hey, but come on back, you know, it's a business, we have those customers. Yes, yes. This is this is this economical scenario we live in. Those are our customers. This is how we sell to them. So the fact that we ship it tomorrow will change nothing because we were gonna spend like three weeks training operations and stuff like this, no? And then you can not change, but drive a change in a, in a solution, yes, no? Yes. Because you're inciting more signals, more information into the product team 
and through that you're contributing a lot to the solution absolutely because absolutely. you can drive it and in the first scenario i would say you're much more calling a shots mm -hmm. so you're everywhere and then you're it's easier for you to make decisions over the solution if you're like here with the tasks of the developments and here you're in the designs and, yes, and yes, you're trying yes. to you know orchestrate the whole thing mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense no for me it's like focus on where you can work on a value which is more on this co-creation or design processes i would say than yeah. the engineering part i really like it and it's really needed so when you're having this co-creation process then you have this feasibility kind of view that yeah. developers will bring you always thinking of how can they actually make the solution you will have more like the ux perspective from the designer and of course yeah. the one of the yeah viability from the business yeah. and, and then the three together it's what yeah yeah, yeah. What, what we should have yeah, yeah, at the end. <laughs> yeah and then what else do we do in the solution so for product managers there's also like the stakeholders mm. expectation management part different schools and different things gonna work with different people but i would say that if you're working in like let's make a clear definition there are feature teams and there are product teams no uh -huh. i mean if your relationship in a company is most of the time you're tasked with features you can reverse engineer them back to the customer problems etc but it's always gonna be a struggle and you're feature-led company, you're most probably feature factory. It's not bad. It's just the type of people working. Um, when you have more empowered product teams, etc., it's going to be much different life. And in those cases, I can say a bit more. So for the empowered product teams, I would say setting a quarter, six weeks, whatever is your time in space uh, that you need to create like uh, valuable solutions. Uh, I would create OKRs for this period mm -hmm, of time mm -hmm. so let's say you you do it quarterly and then syncing with the with the stakeholders on the top of the numbers no because the, the trick with the number is whenever you set the goal for yourself number wise you should not assume uh, zero one mm -hmm. no so the number if you have right now 500 of something and you want to get to the thousand of something it means you should be able to deploy something in the first month to have influence over this number, no? Because yes, that it's leading you towards it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. If you're like, I'm going to be lucky and I'm going to deploy it two days before the end of the quarter or whatever other deadline, and then I'm for sure going to generate this 500 <laughs> customers more, it's like, no, you're, you're calling bullshit, no? Yeah. So for me, it's in easy mathematics. It's like, we want to get here, no? If we don't do anything about this number by X, it's not going to be that number we wanted, no? So it's more setting up a pace with stakeholders to be able to follow up on those numbers. Uh -huh, and then you uh -huh. come back and you say, hey, the number is not moving, we are doing nothing, but that's fine because then the discussion is not going to be about what features you do because you do nothing. It's more like I don't have ideas to move this further or I have some blockers, no? Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. it's a, if you go back to features in these discussions, then you're lost, no? Because people are going to have opinions, etc. Yeah, yeah. If you're talking numbers and the fact that you cannot move numbers and your lack of ideas or whatever, different discussion no so then hey maybe let's change the plan or no 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 we really need to do it maybe we can help you with the ideation no because sometimes maybe those yeah. are gonna have these ideas that you're lacking but it's a different different signal to them so i would say it's like and finding a peace with them i don't know i would say <laughs> be weekly if okay. i need to pick something it's like every two weeks some numbers should move somewhere mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. don't move them probably you should say start saying that you're not moving them Mm -hmm. And being super transparent. So hiding stuff from stakeholders, that right, never works. So we just be transparent. No? And if they're jerks, change the company, <laughs> really. Yeah. So, so thinking about uh, people from outside the team, yeah. as you were talking, uh, from the designer perspective, you need to be very much aligned with other designers, especially in big products, because uh, different teams can be touching uh, mm -hmm. different parts of the system at the same time. So you want to, you know, make sure that the flow, the the full picture of the of the user flow is consistent and that you know everything makes sense together. And as well, if you're working on a big company, as we are in the planner, uh, paying a lot of attention to the to the UI kit. Okay. I'm yeah. not saying that I'm very good with that one. I know <laughs> I have to improve. Let's say anything. But, but no, but, but it is true that it, it, I mean, it's important. So you have your library of components to yeah. make sure that the developers, everybody use the same components and the whole system is consistent. So you need to be up to date with, uh, with whatever it's in the UI kit, the tools you have, 
and and yeah, this would be I would think I would say people from outside the the team you need to yeah. be to be synced with. Yeah. yeah. Oh, one more tip. Actually, this is a tip. So whenever you have sorry, this is coming back to the alignment, but okay. it came back to me. It's like the worst thing that anybody can do to anybody, not even product manager, but human to human is like you set the deadline in two weeks from now yeah and then on the dead of the deadline you say like hey i'm not gonna pass it let's move it further no <laughs> but then, and okay. then you yeah. know on the paper everything's fine no you yeah. before the end of the deadline you'd let know that something's gonna change so everything's fine no it's like mm-hmm. cool mm-hmm. Uh, in a company this means like thousands or dozens of people are like we need to change ship now right now no so it's better to follow up a bit earlier if something changes so what i like to do is create myself like reminders already okay so it's like you know if there is a deadline end of quarter or whatever i'm having like upfront like for a quarters i have upfront like three checkpoints for myself like as a reminder in a to-do app i'm using just to you know remember that hey it's gonna ping me to you, you need to triple check the strategy what the hell are you doing does it still make sense it's been a month etc no mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. i have enough time to follow up no so we still have in the case of a quarter on the first one i still have two months no so if yes. anything doesn't seem going well i can change it no in a shape up it's like six weeks no every six weeks you're like trying to what's gonna be our next six weeks uh, focus the same no you can follow up this six weeks and then okay so where are we what's our opportunity space what's the mm, landscape mm. No? so but, constantly be checking the whole context yeah to make sure we're in the in the right direction yeah, yeah. But, and, uh, but for myself i needed to create like hard points in the calendar okay. to do to do it no so to be constantly remembered to do it because it also doesn't make sense to do it daily or weekly like it, the things usually doesn't change that often mm-hmm, so it's mm-hmm. like giving yourself some period of time but being able to you know react early on no? yeah yeah so you're not coming this last day of the quarter saying like ah pff, you know nothing worked <laughs> and i did it a few times in my life you know? it's, <laughs> it's not that nobody does this yeah uh and one more thing as well i think uh communication as well from outside the team with with you already mentioned yeah. more from a from a product perspective but as well from a from a solution perspective right yeah. so updating other people from outside the team how the solution is is looking Uh, in case they have feedbacks in case i don't know they need to be informed about how it's gonna look and for this one i would say i'm a lot of times doing something very bad for a product team but i love it so i'm sharing everything internal from the team outside like i don't care how private is the document it's a document it's a file in that google yeah, drive yeah but no? why is it going to be private no like yeah yeah i mean a lot of times it's like the teams say uh we need to have our internal notes and it's gonna be super technical and super into the we're detail still thinking like, on we're it. still thinking it's gonna change three sure. times yeah. and it's like yeah fine so it's gonna change great so Let's give it to the people, and if it's gonna change, those people already gonna know it's changed. Yeah, and you so don't need to update them and go there. And if you have, I'm not saying invite every stakeholder to every ideation meeting, etc., because we should not be doing design by committee, no? Yeah. Like Camel is a horse designed by committee, basically. No, it's a <laughs> terrible horse. Yeah. Uh, um, but at the end of the day, giving them the full like access to the informations and. Yeah making them part of a decision making process but not in a way they're making the decision they're informing the decision mm-hmm, early on mm-hmm. amazing no it's like they will just tell you this design is amazing and then you say hey but we cannot do it so how can you work around it no and, and things like this so full transparency oh, every time i heard from some product teams that this is bad of please don't share that early but i'm like yeah 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 early you can do just share it no if it's ugly better I, I prefer early as well, so then you can shift earlier as well. Yeah. In case there's some information that you missed that can totally happen and then someone gives it to you, it's better to know it in advance, yeah. even if the designs are still ugly or whatever, than, yeah, yeah. than later. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, so that's that. Anything else? You touched on communication. I would say the last tip I would I would give is if you're working in longer than two week cycles, so you're working in Kanban shape up, whatever, mm-hmm. there's nothing like over communication the first week. 
yeah. or first two weeks. Mm -hmm, no, mm -hmm. the, there is not such thing. If you need to ask the question three times, ask it five yeah. times. Yeah. If you need to repost the message on a Slack, repost the message on a Slack three times. No, posting the message in a group with a lot of people. Great work. Yes, no, it, it's amazing. <laughs> Nobody's no? going to be annoyed of. Yeah, of yeah. Thinking, There's probably yeah. like more optimal or productive ways of making people informed. But I would say in the first week of alignment, if you're thinking about some building something for six weeks upfront later on yeah. you're gonna do a lot of co-creation no but those first weeks of picking where to start actually i believe they drive the solution further no yeah. and a lot of decisions made then and are gonna be unreversible later mm -hmm. into the project so it's it's really important for me to over communicate yeah. like everything three times yeah. anything else in your belt no, I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. For me, for, for me to also, yeah. that, that, that's all. Um, hope you will enjoy um, yes. this episode and maybe some of the methods, tricks, hacks we do are going to be useful for you guys. Yes. Or maybe to see how you do it differently as well. You can comment. If yeah. You... If you want to challenge anything, yes. share, <laughs> share with us. Or if you want to share your own like experiences, feel free to, to, to comment on YouTube or any, anywhere else you're, you're listening to. Um, and see you in the next episode. Yeah, Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye.